Tonight I want us to look into the Word. Mark chapter 6, verse 30 through verse 34. We're going to read several verses of Scripture tonight. Amen. It says, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus and told Him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in a boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. So he began to teach them many things. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, I lost my place. This is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them to make them all set down in groups on, green grass, on the green grass. So they sat down in ranks of hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed them, and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of fish. Now those that had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that I have to share your word. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity I have to grow in your word. Lord, I pray that you would allow me to share effectively the message, the, 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 the sermon, the power that you have shared into my heart. Lord, allow me to effectively share that into the hearts and lives of those that are here tonight. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. Tonight I want to talk about deserted places. And, and, and what we're going to do in, in, in just a few moments, I'm just going to start going through this story again, verse by verse. And we're going to look at what the Bible says. You know what happens to us so many times? Especially stories like this one, the feeding of the 5,000. How many of you have heard this story before? If you were here this morning, you need to raise your hand because you heard it before. It's one of those stories that we've heard from the time we were little kids growing up in church. And if we're not careful, we start and we go, oh, this is the feeding of 5,000. I know what happens here. He gets five loaves and two fish, and he multiplies and feeds everybody. It's all good. Great. Yay. Amen. We get the Cliff Notes version, the skim version. But I'm here to tell you God gives us insight. I think it's amazing to me, and, and, and tonight is a real illustration of the fact that God can speak through passages in multiple ways. Tonight is a real illustration because this morning I preached a sermon from this very passage about the way God looks at people and the way men look at people. Now some of the things I'm going to say tonight is going to cross over what I did this morning. But tonight I'm going to come with a very different look at this story. Well, Pastor, how can you do that? Because it's a lie. And we need to learn to take our time and read the Word. I love what Pastor Lee said. 
He said, I have heard things over and over all my life, and I've always thought it was for somebody else. And all of a sudden I went, whoa, that's for me. We need to read, when we read the Word, read every word as it is pertaining straight to us because every word was written. <coughs> every word was written for us. It was written. I, I'm not a self, I'm not, I'm not putting out a selfish idea that the Bible was only written for me, but the Bible is so alive and so supernatural and so wonderful that it was written in a way that it directly affects my life personally. This is not just a book. These are not just stories. These are life-changing events that are in the Bible for a reason. I am notorious for reading the Bible and going, what do I care? What, Pastor? Let me explain. I'm notorious for reading stories like this and going, you know what? I ate lunch. I'm not hungry. I, 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 I'm not starving. I had a big old piece of dessert about 2.30, 3 o'clock this afternoon. I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty comfortable right now. I, I, I don't really understand the 5,000 in a deserted place being hungry. That don't affect me right now. Now, if after church, God wanted to carry me in the spirit to Applebee's and ba- pay my bill, Man, now that I could appreciate. Hallelujah. But you know what? I have to ask myself, why are these stories there? If I'm not hungry, this story means nothing. But God says, I do have a meaning beyond the food. But we've got to read it and let God show us that story. So let's go back to verse 30. The apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both that they had done and what they had taught. They come in and Jesus said, we've been busy. You told us to go out and preach and teach and cast out devils and heal the sick. And man, look at all the stuff we've done. You ever been there? Oh, I've done this, I've done that. Well, I, I you know, back Easter time. We were still in the revival, and we come across a weekend, Easter weekend. And Easter weekend, I did four services in three days with two dramas. I was the lead in both. I was the only cast member in one of the dramas. I was the lead character in the other drama, and I preached two of the four services outside of that. And... I bragged about it. Yes, I bragged about it. You pre- preach two sermons and be in two dramas in, four, in three days, you can brag too. I was like, Ugh. I was exhausted when that weekend was over. I had a blast. I was blessed. I, I enjoyed it. But I was exhausted. Just a, couple, just a couple weeks ago, we had the eternity drama. Seven days. We were up here every night. Going over the lines every night. Oh, you can't send me to hell. You needed me. Some of us were saying, that's not a baby. <laughs> we, 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 we went over this night after night and in three performances. By the end of that week, we were all tired. You could see it on our faces. You should have seen the joy in our faces when we were, when they were loading in, when they were unloading and putting the, the scenery up, and how slowly we moved when we were taking the scenery down. We were tired. The disciples come back here and they're going, "Look at all the stuff we did. We've done such a great job." But you, if you read this and you really look at what's going on, you understand they're going, "Man, look at all the stuff we talked." And we did this, and then went, oh, and then I went, I went over here. And so Jesus, and he, capital H being Jesus, said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. 
for there were many people coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. Now, this is powerful as we get further into the thing. They've been out doing ministry. They come back. They're excited. They're telling Jesus, but there's so much hustle and bustle that they didn't even have time to eat. I wish my cousin was here. Uh, my, my cousin has to eat at a certain time every day. And I try to appease that and take care of it. But it seems that every time he's with me, he winds up eating late. And when it gets past about 1230, my cousin starts wringing his hand. And he'll pace. He'll go, I got to eat. I, I got to eat now. I, I, I got to eat. And I said, Shane, deal with it. God gives us knowledge to eat when it's the right time to eat. It's time to eat. And he just wrings his hands and he paces the floor. I, when they were out here preaching revival, I was going to take him out and do a cookout out at LeCleve Park. And, and many of you know, I got out there and realized I forgot the, I had the, the charcoal, but I forgot the plates. I forgot the matches. I forgot the lighter fluid. We had the meat and the charcoal. No way in the world to cook it or nothing to put it on. I won't even tell you how he got that fire started. But, um, but he was ready. He was, it was time to eat. The disciples were ready. They were hungry. And Jesus says, you need to go to a deserted place. This is my deserted place tonight. My empty spot. I was going to take another row out, and I thought, no, that's too many chairs for Pastor Bradley to have to put back this week. And somebody was saying something, I said, yeah, I've preached this sermon once before, and I took all the chairs out and put them up against the, back, up against the walls. And so everybody was just all the way out against the walls, and the middle of the church was completely empty. But again, that would be way too much work for me to set up and Pastor Bradley to fix. So... Um, but he says you need to go to a deserted place now let me talk about one side of the deserted place and we talked a little bit about this this morning but can I tell you I come by here to tell you can I, can I tell you tonight that we complain about the deserted places but God sent us there Oh, God put me out here in the middle of nowhere. Because that's where God needs you. There's nobody around because God wants you to rest. God sends us into seasons and places in our life that feel deserted. It is not a punishment. It is not a slap in the back of the head. It is a place of rest for you. It is a place of preparation for you. We need to stop complaining about the deserted places. Oh, there are times that I long for the deserted places. My... My sister-in-law lives in eastern Pennsylvania. And when we lived on the east coast, about every six to eight weeks, I'd look at Beth and go, you need to go see your sister, don't you? She goes, why? I said, because I need to go to Easton. Why in the world would I want to go to Easton? Boy, I love all of you that are from Easton if you're watching this. But Easton is sort of dirty. And the house in Easton is cramped and it's a it's a townhouse and there's a lot of people and there's coming and going and but something happens when I go to Easton. When I go to Easton, I walk into that house and I instantly have zero responsibility. Zero. If I want to stay up all night long and watch movies, I can stay up all night long and watch movies. If I want to turn on my nephew's Xbox and play video games, I can turn on the Xbox and play video games. If I want to go to bed and not get up for a day and a half, I can go to bed and not get up for a day and a half. The only, the only responsibility I have the whole time I am in Easton is to eat the rice and beans that my sister-in-law makes for me every time I go. That's my only responsibility in the whole week or 
three days, and when I get there, I walk in the door, I go, when we having rice and beans? All right, I'll see you then. And I disappear. <laughs> Gone. Two weeks ago, or a couple of years, or a year ago, we went down there, and it was during the, it was during the uh, General Assembly, and they, strain, they, they were streaming the business meetings live on the Internet. And I could not have done this any place else but at Annette's. But at Annette's, I was able to get in a room and shut the door and lay there and watch the General Assembly every business session. I couldn't have done that anywhere else because I'd had, oh, well, you need to do this. Or, Tommy, can you do this? Even at home, you get those honeydews. Man, there, I, don't, I didn't get any honeydews. Didn't have to go anywhere. Didn't have to do anything. And I just get to relax. And I love going to Easton. We need to long for deserted places. Haven't done one in a long time. I got, I'm, I'm hoping to do one here before Christmas. When I was pastor in Wilmington, Delaware, I used to take prayer retreats. And I'd get away for a couple of days, and I'd go someplace where nobody but Beth knew where I was at. So I could just pray. One time I went so far, it's half a mile from the house, and got a hotel. Everybody thought I was out of town. I was half a mile down the road. Pray. Why? Because I needed a deserted place. We need to look for the deserted places in our life. God sends us to deserted places. And so the disciples said, all right, let's go. <laughs> Vacation, here we come. They departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. Look at that. They're already getting. We're going by ourselves. No, you cannot come. Nope. You know what? Love to have you join me next time. I'm going by myself this time. But all of a sudden, there was an invasion. But the multitude saw them departing. And many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. Oh, we know where Jesus is going. And boom, the deserted place becomes a crowded place. Talked a little bit about this this morning. As this deserted place, when they get off the boat, it is full of fifteen to 25,000 people gathered in to this hillside, this mountainside, this area where they were going to re to to retreat, to relax. They had invaded their space. Can I tell you, we're never happy. Oh, God's got me all out here by myself. God got all these people around me. We complain about both sides of deserted places. We complain if we're by ourselves, and we complain if we've got to be around a bunch of weird people. And everybody knows that church folks are weird. We, 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 we get out there, and, and, and we're like, God, we're supposed to be resting. We're supposed to be relaxing. Oh, I, I, I remember going places and thinking, I was on vacation once at the Grand Canyon. I don't know anybody at the Grand Canyon. And I'm relaxing, hanging out with my family. And I'm walking through one of the gift shops, and somebody goes, Pastor Tommy! And I'm going, go, not here! No! It's one thing for somebody to say, hey, Tommy. But when they say, Pastor Tommy, that means that I have to be Pastor Tommy. And I turned around, and it was a teenager to be a part of a ministry that I was associated with that was working her summers in this gift shop. Really, I can't go anywhere. God says, every time there's an invasion of your private place, your secret place, we got to remember that people matter. We talked about that this morning. we got to remember that people are important. We need to love people. We need to long for people. We need to be hungry to help people. When Jesus got out of the boat, he was moved with compassion. We talked about all this this morning. He was moved with compassion. He, he, he saw that they needed a leader. They needed a teacher. And, and, and instantly he began to want to serve them. When we are invaded in our deserted place, we need to, to have the heart that we want to serve. 
instead of the pious attitude that you need to get out of my place. You need to get out of my seat. You need to get out of my parking spot. You, 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 you need to, you know, I will be holy at church, but I don't have to be holy at, at, at Walmart. I don't have to be holy here. I don't have to be holy there. No, when we see people, we need to realize that God has placed them there for a reason, and they matter. They matter. So the disciples come. For the day was now far spent. I want you to get this picture. They've come. They've told Jesus all they were doing. Jesus, Jesus said, you need to go away because, man, it's so busy here. You haven't got to eat. They get there. I believe they still haven't eaten. I, I, I believe I believe that they, they still didn't know what they were going to do for food. And they come and they said, Hey, Jesus, it's getting late. This is a deserted place? I, I know you're the Son of God and all, and, and I believe you're the Messiah, but you told us to go to a deserted place, and you missed it, buddy, because <laughs> this ain't a deserted place. If, if we run real quick back to the city, that might be deserted, but this out here is not deserted. You ever felt like that? God sent you to a place you thought you were going to get to rest, and you got there and looked around and went, God, have you seen who's here? This isn't deserted. This isn't, this isn't a place that I can relax. And they said, I want my vacation, and I want it now. Send them away. You know what they wanted? They wanted Jesus to get up and say, Hey, we're glad you all came out here, and I go home. We, me and the disciples, we want to spend some alone time together. So y'all go on. You ever been there in a relationship? You ever, you ever, you ever had you and your wife or you and your girlfriend, and all of a sudden somebody was always tagging along, and at some point you said, hey, go away. Go away. I'll never forget what it was like when we went out to eat one night, and they said, how many? We said, We ain't got no kids. They went away. There's something about that opportunity to be alone. And the disciples wanted Jesus to tell everybody, go away. This is time just for my disciples. You know, we do that to God today. God, don't let these people come into my church. Don't, 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 don't let them invade my church. They may want to sing songs I don't like. They, they may want the preacher to preach longer, and I want him to preach shorter. They might not dress the way I wanted, want people to dress in the church. And we have all these excuses why we want to be alone with God. Let me tell you something. You want to be alone with God, that is great, that is important. But you do that in your prayer closet, not in the house of God. We are constantly wanting to send people away. But Jesus says, now, sir. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And then they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want us to go spend two denarii? or excuse me, 200 denarii worth of bread so we can feed them? That's a year's wage. That's one year's wage. Should we waste that much of our reserves? I'm going to tell you, this is one of the places that I believe. And I've heard people that have thought different things, but this is what I believe. One of the places that indicates that Jesus' ministry was not broke. Because in this scripture, they do not say, Jesus, we don't have 200 denarii. To buy bread. They said, do you want us to spend that much? So that indicates to me that there was 200, there was a year's wage in their treasury box that they could have went and bought. But I want you to pay attention to what happens here. They start getting defensive. Do you want me to spend money on this? But Jesus says, 
How many loaves do you have? Let me rephrase that question for you. What is in your deserted place? What do you have here? We go and we complain and we worry and we try to get rid of things and we say, how are we going to do this and how are we going to do that? When all the time we never take the time to look and see what's in our deserted place. Or maybe who's in our deserted place. Jesus was already standing there. He said, go and see what you got. And when they found out, they come back and said, five loaves. And two fish. Now, I used to read this and I thought, man, now that's just stupid. Because if I was a disciple, you, you got to know me, I'm a meat person. I love meat. You, you get some meat and you cut it open, put some more meat in it, and wrap that with some more meat, and that makes a great meat meal. I, I, when I got married, I ate nothing green. I didn't want any kind of, I just wanted meat. There ain't nothing like going to one of those buffets like Golden Corral on steak night and getting steak and chicken and, and shrimp and all the meat. Man, I pile up a big old plate full of meat. My arteries look at it and go. I say that if I can eat a meal that my arteries cry while I'm eating, I'm enjoying myself. And, and, and I, I'm a meat person, so if I was out there, I'd be going, Jesus, we only got two fish and, and a few rolls. But no, they said, we got five loaves. Oh, yeah, and we got two fish. Jesus only asked about the bread. How many loaves you got? They come back, we got five loaves, and we do, we do have two fish. And I used to say, man, that's such a weird question. And then I began to put some things together. Because after that, Jesus comes and gives them instructions. Tell them to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now I want you to pay attention to this. Verse 39, he commanded them to make them sit down in groups on the green grass. Okay? That's instruction. But you see the very next thing that happens. I think. There it is. So they sat down in ranks in hundreds and fifties. See that? God gave an instruction, they responded with obedience. In the midst of all their complaining, in the midst of all their whining about being out there and being invaded by all these other people, they still had enough common sense to obey God. These two verses get read through the story and nobody thinks about them. But you don't get the blessing until you obey the instruction. You hear what I'm telling you? You don't get the meal until you obey the instructions whether you feel like it or not I've said many times that when I was a kid my dad would tell me to do stuff and I'd say I don't want to and he said do it anyway I said why because I said so and I go around muttering well when I'm a daddy I'm going to tell my kids why and now I'm a daddy and you know what because I'm daddy is plenty of reasons That is a good reason, right? Because I'm the daddy. That's why. Yeah, I don't have to make a reason for you. I said do it, do it. You know what? That's how we need to be with Christ. We keep asking God, God, why do you want me to do this? It doesn't really matter. Let's quote one of the sermons I preached a few months ago. Suck it up, buttercup. Do what God says do. If we'll be obedient, all of a sudden we come into a place blessed and broken. Verse 41. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave it to his disciples to set before them. Now I'm going to stop right there for right now. And then we're going to talk about the bread. Look what he did with the bread. The Bible says he looked up to heaven, he blessed the loaves. And he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples to set before them. I heard, heard a preacher preaching about this one time. He talked about, he believed that as they broke the bread, they would go to each group and they would break off another piece and give to them. 
And every time they broke the bread, there was more bread to break off. It wasn't that the loaf grew. It was there was always bread there to break off. Every time they broke it, it grew. Every time they broke it, it grew. And I began to think, how awesome is that? Every time they walked over and broke the bread and gave you a piece, and you broke it and passed it down, and I broke it here, and it grew. I began to say, God, what, what are you representing with the, script, with the bread here? And I remember the verse that says, Jesus is the bread of life. If anybody partakes of this bread, they'll never be hungry again. And I begin to understand that if we'll become obedient, Jesus, when he was get, per, giving the disciples the Last Supper, for thousands of years they had had a part in the Passover feast that was a picture of the crucifixion with the striped and pierced matzah bread that they had. They would break it. And they would put it in a, in a, a and help me, Beth, what is the, that sauce? The, the, the red sauce that they had with the matzah bread. Do you remember? It was, what was in it? Beets and horseradish in this sauce. And it was red, and when you would break the matzah bread, and if you've ever been in a Seder meal, it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's incredible. In fact, maybe this next Easter, maybe we'll do a Seder meal here. But it, it's absolutely incredible. But you break this matzah bread, and they would squeeze it together, and the red would flow through the piercings on that matzah bread. When, when, when you see that, you go, how did they not understand that this was about the crucifixion? How did they not see the Messiah in this? But when he broke the bread in that part of the meal in the Last Supper, he said, this is my body. I am the bread broken for you, pierced for you, striped for you. And as he reaches to his disciples, he gives a prophetic picture of how the gospel of the power of the bread of life, because the disciples got some from the hand of Christ. And when they broke it off, they handed it out, and when the head of the household broke it off and handed it to their kids, there was more. And every time somebody shared the bread, it grew. Every time they gave the bread away, it grew. Can I tell you that every time we give Christ away, he grows. Every time we give Christ away, every time we go to somebody and we say, well, let me tell you about the love of Jesus, he grows in our life. Every time we break Christ in our heart and give him to somebody else, he grows. You know why we become more and more powerful? You know why we become more and more anointed as Bible teachers and preachers and singers? Because every time we get up, and we break the bread of Jesus Christ, and we give it out, God replenishes himself and his power in us. I have grown as a minister not because of head knowledge, not because I've got smarter, not because I've got older, because God keeps growing in me. We look at some of the teachers in our churches. We go, how do they know so much? Because they keep breaking the bread. They keep giving it away. See, these five loaves represent Jesus Christ. They are the power of Jesus as he has been broken for us. And as we continue to give him and pass him, he continues to grow in our life. But then I want you to see something I've never seen. And the two fish, he divided among them all. It doesn't say they did the same thing with the fish. It doesn't say that he gave the fish to the disciples. It says that he divided the fish among them all. Well, how did it multiply? I don't know. Can I tell you what I think the fish represent? I think they represent something. Now, don't anybody leave here getting me wrong. I believe this was a physical, natural miracle that 5,000 uh, 5, men plus women and children, some fifteen to 25,000 people ate bread and fish. 
I believe that they physically ate bread and fish in that deserted place. And they took home 12 baskets full. But I believe there's also a spiritual significance. The bread representing Jesus Christ and the fish represents the church. Now, I, I, I want you to see something here. And, 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 and many of if you go through our parking lot out here right now, there are several of you that have fish on the back of your car. They tell me that in the days of persecution, they saw somebody they thought was a believer, they would make a line on the ground. And if that believer would come and finish the fish with the other line, then they could talk openly about faith. If not, they're like, well, they're drawing on the ground for me. They just go on. I've also been told that in the days of persecution, they would use the fish symbol as directions to underground hidden churches. They would point the fish in the direction of the Bible study or the worship group. It was a symbol. It's become a symbol for the church. When I read this passage, I'm about to mess somebody up. When I read this passage, I see the first place that tells me it's okay that we have more than one church. Because Jesus divided the two fish among them all. I believe those fish represent the church. Give come straight from Christ, divided among everybody. Well, Pastor, why do we need a thousand churches? Well, I'm going to tell you, some of them are wrong. Or maybe I should say some of us are wrong. We'll preach that sermon another day. Some of them are wrong. But I think it is important that we have churches that seek to study God, but are walk in different styles. There's nothing wrong with different styles. Nothing wrong with different backgrounds. If we're teaching Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead, and that he is the only way to the Father, I'm okay with you. I can be your friend. I can hang out with you. Now, if you're teaching something else, if you're teaching about your higher power, I got a problem with you. Is every church effective? No. Is every church growing? No. Are some church dying? Yes. But God has given us churches because churches are groups of people who work together. When you have groups of people, you have problems. Let's go to the most basic group of people, a marriage. How many married folks we got in here? I mean, married folks we got in here that's never had a fight with their spouse? I'm going to tell you right now, either you're the biggest pushover in the world or you're a liar. I have had some doozies of fights with my wife. I enjoy fighting with my wife because every time I fight with my wife, I get to make out. I mean, make up. See, she's embarrassed now. That may start a fight time we get home. Yeah! But we'll wait. (laughs) Why do we fight with our spouses? Is it because we don't love each other? No, it's because we do. But it's because we're different people. My wife comes from a background that is nothing like my background. We're, our backgrounds are foreign to each other. And, and we have to reconcile that. Well, get this. My wife has a mind of her own. I, I mean, I married a Yankee woman. She has a mind and not afraid to use it. And, and I'm always like, oh, man, why can't you see this my way? And she's going, Tommy, why can't you see that you're wrong? Then we had kids. Now, I would think that kids, we would never fight with our kids. They're offspring. Baloney. Number one, Anthony's just like his mama. So there's a built-in fight right there. Why can't he see things the way I see them? 
Now, you would think me and Michael would have it made because we are as much alike as any father or son I've ever met in my life. He looks like me, talks like me, acts like me, is as loud as me, and is ever a bit as annoying as I am. And you would think that we would never fight because we're like the same person, but guess what? He gets on my nerves. There are times I look at Michael, and I think I feel so sorry for all the people that have to be around me. Because I know I'm just like him. See, it doesn't matter how much we're alike, what our backgrounds are. We're going to fight because we're different people. But God says, I'm going to give you a church. And yeah, you're going to have some struggles. You're going to have some difficulty. But I'm going to tell you what. You're going to hold each other up. You're going to support each other. You're going to pray for each other. You need each other. Me and Beth, we're about as different as you can get. But that means that we become one. And we make a team. You know what? Same thing happens in the church. I look around the church. I have heroes in the church. I do. I have heroes. I got, I got a few heroes in the church. I got, I got a few heroes in this church. I, I, I love Brother Lowell. Oh, man. What, what a picture of faith. What, a, what an amazing example of what it means to be a man of God. I, I, I love him. My other hero that I, I just like, I, every day I'm like, God, let me be like him, is Jeff. I, every time I'm around Jeff, I'm like, I want to be more like Jeff. But I'm just too stinking loud. <laughs> but, but he amazes me because here's this quiet man that stands for his faith in amazing ways. He, he doesn't have to get up and yell like I do for people to know where he stands in his faith. When he comes in, he goes, I remember I would just been here a few weeks, and he says, Pastor, I want to say something. And he got up and he stood in the pulpit. And he talked about how that the local radio station had refused to use the term Christ- Christmas music. And he read a letter that he had written to him that it offended his faith. In their attempt to be non-offensive, they had become offensive. And I thought, wow, that is all. He wasn't yelling and jumping up and down and waving his fist and getting angry and his, his, his blood veins wasn't pulsing out of his head. He was very calm. He said, don't mess with my Jesus. And you look at him. you know what? I can respect. I can can hunger for the kind of anointing that he had. But I'm never going to be like Jeff. My my first instinct is always going to be to yell, what did you do? Sorry, sweetheart. She jumped about out of her skin. (laughs) That's always my first instinct. But you know what? God puts us together in a church. And I can sometimes be the voice that yells. And he can be the wisdom that drives. Man, it makes a great team. We become a body. Paul says we're all part of one body. The hand can't say, well, I'm not going to be the hand because I'm not the eye. That's the hand looking at everybody. It doesn't work. The nose has to smell. We, we have every part of the body we need. We 
They need every part to do what they were called to do. Jesus was divided. Jesus was handed out, and he divided among us the church. And because of that, they were all filled. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were gathered together in one place. And there came from heaven the sound as of a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And they saw what what appeared to be clothing tongues of fire that split apart and set upon each of them, and they each began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about us coming into a place that we've become obedient, we've went where God told us to go, we've done what God's told us to do, We've quit whining, we've quit crying, we've quit complaining about it, and all of a sudden, Jesus has been multiplied in our heart, the Spirit has brought the church together, and now we begin to come, become filled. Filled with His power, filled with His anointing, filled with His healing, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with His victory, filled with His, with his blessing, with His mercy, with His grace. When we come in the house, we need to know that we're going to be filled when we go out of the house. You don't have to leave this place hungry. You don't have to leave here hungry. You hear what I'm telling you. We have gotten so used to coming to church and going home hungry. No. If we will be obedient, God says, I'm going to fill you up every time you come here. I'm going to give you what you're looking for. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you so much, you're going to take it home. And they took up 12 basketfuls of fragments and fish. And they took them home. I always wonder what happened to that food. Did it all go to the, you know, the, the, one, the one book author talks about a little boy bringing his lunch, and that's what they used. Did it all go to his house? Mom, I'm home. Who are all those men with you? They're bringing my leftovers from lunch. pastor wouldn't that all go bad well i don't know god can make it last he let the oil never run out you know who who knows what that story was i often wonder maybe maybe it was a kid and they didn't have much food but when he come back home because he gave what he had maybe he fed his household for a month i don't know that's not biblical you can't prove i'm right i mean you can't prove i'm I can't prove I'm right, but you can't prove I'm wrong. Because it ain't right. I don't know what happened to it. But I know they took it. They took it home. And I tell you, when we grab a hold of what God is feeding us, we're going to take it with us. We're going to take it home. Your home needs to be as full of the power of God as your church. Well, Pastor, this just doesn't happen in my house, and that means you need to pray. Pastor, I just don't get nothing out of the church to take with me. That means you're not hungry enough. You're not grabbing it. It's here. I can tell every one of you how I can be a better preacher in your life. You read the Word and you pray. If you're reading the Word and you pray, guess what? I'm a better preacher. But if you're not reading the Word and you're not praying and you're living in disobedient light, guess what? It doesn't matter what I preach. I'm going to be a lousy preacher. My preaching ability has nothing to do with me. It has to do with you. You are the one. When you become hungry, you begin. God feeds you. And when you walk out of those doors, you're going to walk out full and you're going to take food with you. And you're going to be blessed. I come by here today to tell you. There's some deserted places. Sometimes you actually get to go to one. Sometimes you get there and it's been invaded. But whatever the case is, God has a blessing for you. Do you know when the story was all over with? Disciples had seen these 5,000 men fed some fifteen to 25,000 people. I don't think any of them said, man, I wish he had sent those people away. No. Look at what we got to see. Look what we got to be a part of. That was awesome. So why don't we make a decision 
here in our little church? Why don't we decide that we're going to get filled? Pastor, if you and Brother Don lead the right songs, we'll know. Has nothing to do with it. Pastor, if you'll preach certain, nope, has nothing to do with it. You want to get filled? Get obedient to God. Seek His touch. Seek Him. And you will find Him. Listen to what God is telling you. We were talking Wednesday night. And we were talking about how that we want to see God move. But it amazes me. We want to see God move, but nobody wants to worship. We want to see God heal the sick, but nobody wants to pray. We want to see God send revival, but nobody wants to come to the services. We want to see God move in somebody else. I come back here tonight to tell you, it's on you. When you come into the house, I'm going to break Jesus open, and I'm going to hand him out. What you do with it from there is going to decide if he's going to grow in your life. Some of us don't get any growth in our life because we never break Jesus off and give him to anybody else. We hold him. We hold him. we got to give him more. take just a few moments tonight. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to get to a deserted place. I, I want you to sit down on the green grass and get ready to eat. Pastor, what are you talking about? I want tonight, I want everybody in this building, I don't care if you come to the front, if you stay where you're at, if you kneel your head, and you kneel down in the seat, I don't care where you're at or how you do it. But I want everybody in the house tonight to find a place and say, God, Lord, if you'll give it to me, I'll give it to somebody. give it away. I want you to ask God tonight to let Jesus be multiplied in you. To show you the strength and the power of the church. To move your life. To move your heart. God, get me out of the way. Let me become so hungry for you. That I run for you. And then when you feel me, let me take my leftovers and give them to somebody else. Let me take what you've given me and break that bread apart and hand it out to somebody else so that you grow in me. Would you make a commitment? God, I'll read your word. But not only will I read your word, I'll tell somebody about your word. Make a point to share Christ so that he can.